I I assume you mean something other than the defaults. Uh, who uses the round hard brush? Oh yes, I do occasionally. <laughs> How about the soft round brush? Yeah. I do. I do most of the time. How many other brushes do you use? None. <laughs> I use other brushes. I have used the uh, a soft blending brush for clouds. Now, now and wait, Mike. You're skipping. You're skipping ahead here. Blending uh, brushes are different than brushes, right? Uh, no, this is just a, a descriptor. Okay. It, it's not a hard edged brush. It's just something. It, it's what Anne was showing us how to make. Uh, I agree. Hey, I have something real quick. I just wanted a digression here. You were doing, we did frequency separation uh, a couple months ago. Yep. And I had the, the, the document you sent out describing how to do that. And I've been trying and trying and trying. I couldn't get it to work. But I, and I was about to email you. And then I tried it one last time. And I realized that I was doing, uh, applying the layer to the wrong layer. And it's great. I love it. It's fantastic. Well, good. Yeah, it, it's an amazing thing. I'm going to have to read the recipe every time I use it, though. It's so complicated. So thanks for that. All right. Well, good. Good. So Rich seems to have some trouble connecting here. Does anybody know what these symbols stand for? I mean, one looks like Wi-Fi and one looks like USB, but mm -hmm. I don't know what that means for Rich. I don't know either. Twice and it it just doesn't seem to be connecting with the video and, and um... is your camera separate? Yes. Is it connected to your computer? Maybe it's not quite plugged in. Maybe got like jerked. Uh, like the cable got pulled well, or something. The microphone is on the camera. Oh well, that doesn't make sense then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm going to sign off again and try and sign back in. All right, that might be good. Why would the Wi-Fi and the USB? Sounds like his camera's dying. Anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about brushes. <laughs> oh, and if, if there's any other things you want to add, I usually, I try to set out an, an agenda before the meeting. And if there are any things that we want to add also, you know, send that to me and I'll put on the agenda. And, and these aren't hard fixed agendas, it's just a guideline. So, uh, what are brushes? Uh, there's Photoshop brushes, the typical standard thing, which you can find in the brush panel. And they're wonderful tools. And then there's brush shapes, which are generally the kind of thing you make into a brush. But I find if I'm using them for a mask, I'd rather use a brush shape than a brush because a brush shape I can place, rotate, scale, all this stuff while I can see it. Whereas a brush, uh, it's, it's our, as soon as I touch it, tap to place it, it it's defined. And then I have to do it on a separate layer and scale, do things to that layer. So there are different purposes there. And uh, one of the cool things about brushes is you can do a, a dab, which is just a tap and get a single stamp, or you can go and do a stroke. And with strokes, <coughs> you can, do beautiful artwork, just like uh, Jason Pollock. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've talked about making brushes before and Anne actually showed us, she was one of the persons that demonstrate how to do it. But uh, I'd like to go through and demonstrate again if, if you guys are interested. Yes. Wanna... Hmm. All sure. right. <laughs> Let me see. You should be able to share your screen, Mike. All right. I just turned on Photoshop. Now. Welcome. I'm back. You made it. <laughs> I just 
to reboot my computer even. <clears throat> oh, that's fine. You know, I have to do that before every meeting. Otherwise, my camera's locked up someplace. All right. There's a screen. Let me find some shapes. Oh, I should have that open already. Yeah. I am going to. Uh, oh, what do we want? This one's just fun. All right. So I grab. You guys can see the screen, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. So first thing you have to do is figure out uh, what kind of uh, uh, Photoshop you're using. If you're using a, a new version, your stamp shape or your brush shape can be 5,000 pixels on the side. Mine can't. Mine's 2,500 pixels, which it, is fine. So I've got a shape here and it can be any color. Uh, most people make them black and white just so they can understand <laughs> which areas are going to be light and dark. Uh, this is going to be a, a grayscale image, which makes it more interesting. So I've got an image here. It's less than 2,500 on the side. So I can go into edit the edit menu and define uh, define brush preset and I'm going to call that uh, fine art one now Mike did you start with a a paintbrush to get this splat yes this was a uh, uh, splatter from watercolor paint okay and actually what I did is I splattered watercolor paint and then I uh, selected the splatter and I removed all the texture from the paper around outside the splatter. Otherwise it would, so this is uh, pure white around the, around the outside and uh, shades of blue or the Thing. Mike, before you get to the next step, mm -hmm. uh, are, are we defining the brush as a white square with stuff in it, or it's just the blue pattern and the white stuff will go away? The brush is anything that is not 100% white. Oh, okay. So the black parts in there are gonna be black and the light blue parts are gonna be tran translated into a gray scale and they're gonna be a light gray part of the brush. Okay. Now, so is it, is it not necessary to translate it to a gray scale first? Uh, no, it'll do that. Now the splatter was created entirely in Photoshop? No, that was created on a piece of paper with some watercolor. <laughs> and Analog. <laughs> then you scanned it. I took a picture of it, so it's a photo. <laughs> and then you, you brought that photo into um, Photoshop. I did. OK. <clears throat> and then I, uh, I did some manipulation to remove all the junk that's in that white area. All right, so last thing I did is I did a uh, save brush preset. So if I go over here and look at, uh, look at my brushes, the last brush in this section is the new brush that we just created. I'm gonna click on that. So now, um, See this new brush is putting out here? Mm -hmm. Actually, let me get rid of that. So now we got this big brush 
and I can paint that or whatever my color is, which is really exciting. But I want to brush that's too big. So I'm going to go in and change the size of that brush. Actually, I'm going to make it much more interesting. Let's see, change the size down to something. That's, that's a good size right there. Let's see the light colored spot parts, the dark colored parts. That was the black, the blue, and the lighter blue. So I'm going to go into this. Uh, click on the brush panel. And right here, I could go and select any of my uh, preset shapes. Okay. All right, so I could pick on, pick uh, these default brushes or some other things that I've made, but I'm going to go down and find the one we just made, which is 2229. Ah, very good, thank you. And I'm gonna set the size down to something reasonable, not that far. Um, let's make it right there. Yeah, that's good. And I wanna rotate it around. So I'm gonna do that. So I can rotate the default brush angle. Now I wanna set a spacing. So I want, you can see down here, below where my cursor is, it shows how this is gonna make a, a nice stroke. I want a little bit more spacing, so, so they're individual things. Just, just for, for grins, you know? Now, that's how it draws. It's gonna draw on the color that I have selected with that spacing and that size. So that's pretty cool, but We've got all this stuff over here. Shape dynamics. This, this is fun. So I can tell, I can have it jitter the size. Jitter is randomly change. Like that. That's pretty cool. I can set the minimum size. Just so when it jitters, it never goes below that. Uh, I can set the angle. Right now I've got it rotating all over. And you can see down here the stroke. Look at the stroke as I change the angle up. Here's zero, they're all aligned. And here they start rotating randomly, which just makes it fun. I forget what roundness jitter is. It, it changes the... Uh the aspect ratio of the overall spot. And I think that's mainly for the uh, round brush. Well, it, it, works, it works on my watercolor brushes. Oh, it does? Yeah. I think it's doing something to this. It's just not extremely obvious with a strange shape. Yeah, it's squishy. And you can set minimum roundness. I'm going to also tell it to flip X and Y randomly. So we're getting pretty random here. Let's look at scattering. So scatter. Actually, over here, when I when this uh, check mark is there, it enables the whole scatter section. At, just like I've enabled all of shape dynamics uh, and transfer, but most and smoothing, but most of these others are turned off. So I just turned on scattering. Uh, it set it. Let's set it to a count of one. Uh, bring that up. So it's pretty cool. I can set it up to a count of seven. And uh, you know, make a flock of these things. <laughs> if you, the, I've got the count jitter turned all the way up. Uh, scatter is four hundred and fifty percent. 
I could make that even more. It spreads all over, or I could make it much less and it would go like a stroke. I like, I like a lot. Now there's texture. Texture, uh, you, it's kind of like um, only painting where your pen would be painting and then it adds the texture uh, from your, the texture sample that you're using. So this one should leave some stripes, some light lines. All right, I've got the scale turn. Oh, well, you can see it's not a clean thing like it was before. There's a clean one because I turned the depth all the way down. Here's one where the texture is affecting it. it makes it much more blotchy, which is fun. Uh, dual brush, I really haven't used, but I think it combines multiple brushes. And you only get the intersection of where your two brushes cross. Uh, which is good for making things even more random, but I, I haven't used it much. Now, color dynamics. This, yes, this is a good one. Uh, all right, so if I just leave the color off, or actually, I don't even know it. Foreground, background jitter? Yeah. What does that do? That switches between your foreground and your background. All right. So you can have some control over the color as opposed to the, the hue jitter, which goes all over the place. All right. So I turned everything off and it's just, you know. Change your black to a red or a yellow yeah. or something. Let's see. Let's make it orange. Orange looks good, looks purple. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to turn the foreground background jitter all the way up. Oh, what does it, it's not giving me, oh, saturation's turned off. I'll turn it up. You turn the brightness up. No, I got something set to black and white. There it is, purity. purity. All right. I'm gonna turn off the texture just for fun. And yeah. This is just beautiful. And then turn on hue jitter, give it a lot of jitter and hue. It, you can make amazing things. <laughs> this, is, this would be great for making uh, abstract backgrounds. Maybe, you know, you, you can set the color range to a much shorter thing. Yeah, I've got huge way up. Let's set it down here. Let's set it way down. Turn off your foreground background also. Turn off my foreground background? Oh, mm -hmm. hi. So, yeah, if you, you can tighten your hue jitter up and just make a really nice pattern, then, uh, of course, I, I like a lot of color, so. <laughs> it just, it's just tons of fun to play with. Uh, transfer, I am not sure what transfer is. You guys know? Yeah, it allows you to control the flow. Um, you can turn on pen pressure and you can control some different, uh, you know, flow and and what is what else is there? The Opacity. Um, yeah, opacity. And you can control them either with pen pressure or there's another one called fade, which gives you a stroke and then it just 
peters out all of a sudden, well, gradually, and it just goes away. So, you know, lots of different ways to apply the brush to the canvas. And then uh, let's see what noise does. Yeah, I think I can see a little bit of noise being added on top of the, uh, I guess that's just noise get, isn't on and off, but you can see a little bit of noise in there. And wet edges, let's see if we get anything there. I'm not sure if I can see wet edges in that. Wet edges uh, means you put the paint down and it, flows to the edge, it makes the edges a little bit more intense as if the watercolor was flowing to the edge and drying out. Let's see what, and I'm not sure what airbrush is doing either. There is one of the resources on our page that uh, really goes into depth about what all these things are doing. Oh, that's not what I would. To wait. Protect texture. Not sure what protect texture is doing either. But just from what I've been playing with, at least it's just lots of fun. Especially, let's turn all these things off. Turn the color all the way up. And I'm going to put black. Right. Actually, I'm not black. Hmm. I didn't want what, although that looks cool too. Yeah, I could play with this for a long time. But well, going through it. I like the black background. I do too, especially, uh, let's see if I'll go and change, tighten that up a little bit, really make those wild. Just do a Gaussian blur on that once and see what that looks like on the whole page. Anywhere from just a little bit to a lot. Do it a lot. All the way. <laughs> Gray. <laughs> yeah, but you can see how you can really get some pretty wild just colored backgrounds. Even if you if you took a brown, black, a couple shades of brown and some blacks, and used a uh, a textured paintbrush, and then just threw a bunch of strokes all over and then uh gave it a little bit of a blur, you could end up with something like a, a, a Renaissance kind of background, which I think it's fun. Any questions? Does anybody care? <laughs> yes, well, this is great, Mike. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah. 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 No, I the only thing from my standpoint is I've got Photoshop elements and I was just looking at the brush controls while you were talking about this, that I have only a fraction of the controls that you would have. All right. So that means maybe I'll have to just bite the bullet and get it. So. <laughs> you won't regret it. Okay. Maybe when I upgrade my computer, I'll probably do that later this year. Yeah, I'm looking at my version of Photoshop, and it, it's got to. Uh, oh, it, it's. I, I thought it was T and Y. It's tilt X, T 
tilt Y. Do you have that on yours? I do not remember that. Uh, mine is 5.5. So I'm years behind. And I'm still learning these things. I got tilt X, override tilt X, override tilt Y, rotate, blah, blah, bunch of stuff like that. Cool thing. You have, that's CS5, or is that CS4 here we're looking at? That's uh, what I learned on. A CS5.5. Okay. I had CS, I learned on CS4. Oh, so it was, no, I learned on CS5, and then, then, I, then I had CS6. And then I subscribed. Let's see. Then, uh, so that's how you can make a brush. That's just crazy brushes, you know, kind of fun things. Uh, Anne was showing us how somebody actually captured an image from a cloud and cleaned up the edges and made that into a brush for making a nice smooth uh, fog or cloud brush. And that worked really good. And I, I do use that kind of a brush a lot if I'm trying to do atmospheric kind of effects. <clears throat> Let's see, I'm going to stop sharing at this point. So you can make all kinds of brushes, uh, but you can also get brushes for free. There are lots of brushes around the internet. Uh, Places like Brush Easy, uh, My Photoshop Brushes. Those are two places that have thousands of brushes in categories like dust brushes or watercolor brushes or broken glass brushes or things like that. Um, and then you can buy brushes. Yeah, you know, I've bought. Uh, I bought a set of beauty brushes from Joel Grimes and it's got like 40 different eyelashes and lips and it's got all these different parts. But if you want to put eyelashes on somebody who doesn't have them, it's a handy way. Well, Mike, it didn't work. You still look the same. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And then... Uh, from Rickard Roden, uh, a lot of the classes I go, I take, they give you a handful of brushes and stuff. So I got a bunch of atmospheric brushes from him, and I use those. So uh, you have twenty two hundred and twenty nine brushes. Oh, I have yeah. many, <laughs> many brushes more than that. Oh, that number, the yeah, 20, yeah, 20, that you just created the new one. It was. That is not, it's a silly number. It's just the largest dimension on that brush. Hmm. <laughs> uh, for some reason, that's what it displays. You can put your cursor over it. Here. Let me show you. I'm crawling around behind you. Yeah. <laughs> You're growing an arm out of your shoulder. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, 29, 29 is the one we just made. If I put my cursor over it, sometimes it will actually display the name of it. Like that, leaf, mountain, ash. And this one we probably didn't, well, what did we name that? Fine Art One, but it's really inconvenient. Because, you know, the 29, 22, 29, that's obvious. So, the, so you, the, it, yeah, now it's like, okay, there's just like brush width, right? Like yep. you were doing a selection. That's just the default brush width. Yeah. And, you know, that's what, something you're going to change right away anyway. So it's, I should have showed you my uh, eyelash brushes. 
<laughs> but it's just 40 eyelashes, different <laughs> angles, different strength, and all kinds of things. So you can buy them, you can get them for free, search for brushes. If you ever have a need for a brush, uh, search them on the internet, you'll find tons of them for free. It's a lot more fun to make them. It is, um, unless you need a brush real quick or you need eye, eyelash brushes. I would have had to go and buy a bunch of artificial eye eyelashes and take pictures. If, if you subscribe to Adobe, Mike, there is a bunch of brushes that you can download as part of that subscription. All right. It's almost an endless number, actually. I believe it. It's worth $9.99 a month. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All packages. <laughs> so, so brushes are saved in a, a brush file. There's the ADR format. And I think there's a newer format too. But do you know how to load those? All you have to do is double click on the ADR file. It'll open up Photoshop and load them in. So it's easy. Uh, I'm sure there's other ways to do it, but that's the easiest way. And Jim, you were talking about how to organize brushes. I don't have a good way to organize, except I can get a set of brushes I like for beauty and export those. You know, save them as uh, beauty dot abr and just clean out all my brushes and load those in uh that's the only easy way i have of sorting i don't i think in the newer versions rich you're shaking your head what do they yeah. do yeah they um you can organize they used to have a brush manager and a pattern manager and a you know, they also have another type of file called a TPL, which is a tool preset, but they've done away with that pretty much because they it's now inclusive in with the brushes. So now the brushes you can organize into folders and folders within folders. And, uh, you know, so what I usually do is put them all in a folder and then whenever you expand the folder, I have, uh, oh, it's more of a line and it has the name right out to the right. So you see it immediately. It's, you don't have to hover over the brush in order to see it. So that's just one of the default layouts that you can set your brush panel to. So, um, you know, but it, it becomes very easy then to organize your brushes right in the brush panel. That would be nice. Yes, upgrade. Yeah. <laughs> One day. Um, Mike, I, I think there's a, I, I found another video. I've been out to Udemy. Um, you know, it's an online learning platform and they have lots of videos and things. But there's one called, what was it called? Painting Environments by Hardy Fowler. You wouldn't believe what he does with the brushes. And he also uses, um, what do they call them, shapes? Because with a shape, what you can do, same thing you did with your brush, you actually select it and then down in the bottom, where the vector symbol is, you can go, oh, you got to go to the paths uh, uh, in the layers panel, you know, generally the paths are in there also as one of the tabs. And so if you go there, there's a little icon down there that will take your selection and a path for the whole thing. It now becomes a vector infinitely scalable um, and you can set the size of the resolution to I think from 0.5 to 10 pixels and that's the limit but whenever you do that you have this pattern and this Hardy Fowler video 
Um, if you go out to Udemy, the courses are always like $110 or $130, but they're always having sales and you can get it for like $11.99 or $13.99. So don't pay the premium price if you go out there. But that course is totally mind blowing what you can do with creating, using, I mean, he starts from scratch and creates, uh, you know, these, these scenes that are just incredible in just a few minutes so, with brushes and shapes. Rich, so, yeah. could you explain the difference between a vector brush and a raster brush or are they all vector brushes? No, they're raster. You know, raster actually is a pixelized version. Right. A vector is actually a series of points that are connected to connect the dots. And so whenever you expand it, you can make that any size and, you know, the actual shape stays the same. So, um, does, you know, does it allow you to have different, different, uh, grayscale within the object if you're using a vector brush? Um, I don't think so. I think it's a black and white rendition. Okay. But I may be wrong on that, you know, but, you know, from looking at this Hardy Fowler video, it looks like, you know, and he actually explains how you create a brush and how you create a shape. And uh, so I've been playing with some of those and making some shapes. I've cut out some trees and actually made a shape from trees. And I cut out a rock face and made a shape out of the rock face. And because it's a vector, you can actually use a free transform on that vector object. And you can stretch it and squeeze it. And, and I mean, you have to watch the video. I, I mean, it, it's totally amazing what he does. What's um, the class? It is called painting the painting environments by Hardy Fowler. H A R D Y. Yes. Very good. I'll put that in our list. Yeah, and, and the other one that I was playing with was um, Lori Jill, and she takes a photograph and turns it into a painting. And the way she does it, I mean, you know, this it used to be in the older versions of Photoshop, but I can't find the action in the new version, so I had to create my own. But basically, you take an image, I mean, I, I, I let the action do it now, but basically you take the original photograph, you duplicate the layer, you turn the, um, uh, the opacity down to 1%, you create a blank layer on top of it at 100%, and then you merge the two layers so you have 100% opacity with a 1% picture under, in, in, you know, in the background. And now you can take what they call a mixer brush in Photoshop, a mixer brush will take whatever's on the canvas and smear it with, you know, whatever you have loaded on your paintbrush. But like you can also wet paint. What's that? It's like wet paint. Yes, it's like wet paint. But yeah. you can you can unload the paintbrush and just use the mixer brush on that one percent level, and you swipe your brush over it. And voila, whatever, whatever kind of brush tip you have on that brush will, you know, on whatever, you know, the shape dynamics or any of the brush dynamics that are, you've loaded onto that brush, you'll see streaks and, you know, and so you can actually then just kind of rub that over that what appears to be a blank image and it reveals it <laughs> and it's cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, so that's the, the two techniques that I've been playing around with 
and you know it, it, it's a learning experience for sure but is that hardy fowler and you know what he does with brushes and shapes and the lori jill how she would take a photograph and turn it into a painting we've got a link to that one on the website now yes yeah and that's another one that's on udemy oh i thought this is one that was just on youtube yeah, she has a, a, a preview, more or less, on YouTube. But the uh, full painting from a photograph is on Udemy. There are lots of examples on YouTube of painting with the mixer brush in Photoshop. Yes. yes. So oil paint is what you were talking about? That yes. was that was version two or three ago in Photoshop. You could apply oil paint yeah. to any image and get yeah, but it, it's not a filter. It, it's actually a hand painted uh, effect. It's, That's it's very good. Yeah. So you say you have the, the, a real photo on the bottom and another layer on top, and you turn the one on top to 1% uh, or 2% or something like that, and you use a mixer brush and yes. just go over it? Yes. And you don't you don't have to select colors or anything. Nope, it picks the color. And really, it's a cloning brush. Whenever it's in that mode, so it takes the color from the original photograph. Yes. Rich, do you want to give us a demo? I can now that my video is working. <laughs> yes, that's much better. Yeah, I'm totally confused, but interested. <laughs> It's a way of making your paint, your uh, photograph into a painting with actual brush strokes that have been done by a human. It, it does seem like you could do that by other techniques already. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we'll, we'll see what he. Well, there's a technique called smudge painting, too, that I've never understood, but I've seen results and they look really very interesting. Okay. Just use the smudge tool. Got it. Yep. I'm trying to find a picture. It's not it. It's in here. Okay. I'm getting close. I've been studying Corel Painter. Corel Painter is made for this kind of stuff. Yes. It's really powerful. Which one did you get, Mike? Painter? Yeah. 2021. Uh, 2020. So you're willing to spend the money on Corel, but not on Photoshop? <laughs> well, no, I bought Corel Painter 2020, and it'll last me forever. Just yes. like Photoshop 5.5. Yeah. Okay, I'm about set up here. I had to open up some photos. Let me get back to <sighs> Yeah, and besides the mixer brush, there's the history brush, the art history brush, and I really have not found a use for those two. Mixer brush? Yeah. But history brush, it will use as a source of paint some previous stored state of your image. And well, there's someone that actually tells you how to use the you know history. Um, who was it that's that's big in Alistair Ben? Yeah, he's a black and white photographer. He uses the history brush all the time to bring back. Uh, elements that he's lost basically in the current version. So you paint it back in and, uh, you know, it's totally amazing what you can do. What's his name? Alistair? Alistair, yeah. Ben B, I think it's B E N N, uh, 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 something like that. Alistair. Okay, shall I share my screen? Please. Yep. Okay, I'll show the whole desktop. 
Where's my desktop screen? I think that. Okay. Can you see anything here? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Mill? Nice, nice photo of a crystal mill. Photo too of the famous photo of famous building in the mountains. Yes. Okay. <laughs> let me, that's the wrong one. I gotta find the light. There it is. Oh yeah, that's much better. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna zoom in here, but you can see this is some of the brushwork that I've done. This is, realize this is, you know, I'm just starting this painting. But this is the kind of thing that you can get. Um, you know, these trees, if I turn on, I got to move everyone out of the way. Um, you can see the, you know, the, the way the leaves looked originally. And what I was trying to do with my paintbrushes. <laughs> and, you, you know, a lot of the work is stylized, heavily stylized on what you can do with this. Is this a mixer brush? This is a mixer brush here, yes. And this, this was all done with it. Well, no, I take that back. This was not done with a mixer brush. That was actually done with a brush. All this, right. this down here and the rocks down here were done with the mixer brush. And you can see how it smears the paint, but realize this is a, a work in progress and I've got to add detail to all this. You put in highlights and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, detail that you would normally put in in a painting. This You're not here, taking the detail from the original photograph, though, right? You're adding highlight. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you know, like this is this is a, a brush that did this, and basically it's a brush that you kind of put the dark underneath and then layer on several lighter layers to make it uh, um, show up. Let me let me just kind of demo maybe. Um, I got an action here, I think. Any... Okay, so this is a painting layer now that I just created. I'm going to turn all the rest of these off. Okay, and I'm going to put, you know, the, the, the original picture back on. That's too much. I got to use this one. So um, this is my painting layer. And what I can do is, i got to keep moving this out of the way. Um, I can pick up a brush. If I go into the brush panel here, you can see the way mine are organized. Hmm. Um, you can collapse the folders. So I made some brushes for um, clone painting. Where's one that I got one from uh, Cal Webster, who actually, I don't know, he's associated with Adobe. And if you go out to get brushes at Adobe, they're basically Cal Webster. And he also has a, a video out on YouTube. It's called a masterclass in brushes. And he goes over a lot of the stuff on the brushes. Okay, so I've got this brush here and it is a cloner. So if I run it across, you can see, I'll turn off the background layer. 
What it did, it will smear the paint depending on how far you drag. You know, you can get more detail. You can pick up a different, is this an oil detail? You can, you know, different brushes will give you different effects and different levels of detail that you're pulling out of the photo underneath. But all of that is coming from the original photo. So, so it's sampling the, not just the color, but a pixel region? It is a pixel, yes. It's just under the brush. Whatever pixel on the original photo that are under the brush are pulled out. So you can say it's like a clone stamp tool, but the clone stamp is the, defined by the brush shape. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Mm. So you have you, to do this on a board by board basis. Yes, that's that, I, I did that whenever I was doing the. Uh, uh, I didn't. That's not that. on the building. I, I was talking about, but you had to go to each individual board and and do the brush. That is correct. When you say board, what do you mean? The boards on the, the mill or the stairs. Or the, yeah. I, I, I see. The step, the riser, the side. Well, and the size of your brush determines how much detail, I think. That's right. It, it, yeah. it does affect it. But that, that uh, the one cloner brush that I was using, it was based on one of Kyle Webster's, but I heavily modified it to, to get what I needed out of it. But basically, that's the um the whole thing um i can let me just create a new um i'm gonna make a new canvas here a blank canvas but there are shapes that you can create these are the ones adobe supplies but here's one. Oh. But I, I actually have a photo of some trees that I, I clipped and I created this brush. Um, and you can make it any color. For example, if you go into a, a green and I, so the blue that you're seeing is actually the path the, this is a vector shape. So I can actually, let me get rid of that. Zoom but, on. Yeah. But this is a vector shape. And if I do a control T, which is a transform, um, I got to make a selection. Nope. <laughs> I'm going to have to duplicate this, I guess. Yeah, the lock background. Yeah, it was a lock layer. Okay, so there is. Um, let me get back. Select pixels, control T. Huh. It, it thinks all those are pixels, the white, because it's a white background. But anyway, you can take this. Um, and if you right click after you do a free transform, that's what a control T does. And if you right click inside the object, you can distort it. And you can just make this thing any shape, size, whatever that you want. You know, some of these don't make sense, but. Um, you can really um, warp this thing to your heart's content and make something totally different than what you started with. Now that's not vector right there, is it? This, well, no, it is pixels now because I stamped it. But let me try that again. And 
fact, let me start a new file. And what I made a mistake. I should have made a blank layer to do this. And now if I go into the uh, shape, and now I can just control T and I'm only working on that image. But this is just, you know, basically resizing. You don't lose anything when you resize a vector image. So that's vector, not pixels. This is vector at this point, yes. Zoom in real close on it. It so. didn't. It didn't look vector when you really blew it up. I mean, maybe that's a oh, okay. Uh, it did. So that's blown up to a hundred percent. Okay. Now, how did you make that into a vector? Okay. Well, you have to have an image. If you have an image, you just select it. You know. I don't know if this is going to work. Um, so that's a selection. But you go into paths. And down here, this little thing, um, it says make a working path from the selection. And for some reason, it's not doing it. You know, I don't have everything right here, so. What if you did a left click on, on the uh, icon on the layer? That would just select the content, the non-white. Yeah, yeah. So let me delete this. Let me go back here. Let me say, and I'm going to turn it into a vector. Turn so off I'll your background. Okay. Okay, shall I try paths again? Hmm. You don't have a selection. I, if you did a control left click on that layer, it would just pull up the green, I think. Hmm. I mean, click over on the icon. I'll just do this. That okay. I've got, the, I've got the pixel selected now, so it is now pixel. Based. So now I can go into paths. I can go into create a path from the selection. And you'll see it'll basically turn blue. It's working. So it actually, you know, used its algorithm to uh, define where it would put points to define that image. You can see the bigger green areas. It didn't have that didn't have to go interior to those, you know, it just went along the edges. So now if you come up here, edit, um, right down below the define brush preset is define a custom shape. And if you click it, you can save that now as a custom shape. So you can do that with any image that you have. Um, you can turn you know, trees or grass or, and for environmental painting, you know, that, that basically is what you would use. Did you, your original source, did you have to remove everything but trees? So it was only yes. trees on transparent? Yes. All right. Yeah, and, and you know, another, and I also, um, I also created a brush out of this. If I go into my brush panel, um, so I can paint a whole bunch of little trees. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got several several of these, and you can do them in you know if you go into the color picker and just. We got to move this again. <coughs> Shade darker, you know, you get overlays over it. And so you can actually paint the whole forest with relative ease um, you know, just by creating brushes. And that Hardy Fowler has, a, if you sign up for the course, he has a bunch of uh, 
brushes and shapes that he has with the course. But it, it's a really informative course, and I'm still learning this, so excuse my ignorance on all this. If you took that brush and then went into brush dynamics, very no. disguised, very the hue a little bit around green and very the uh, darkness. Go ahead and uh, let's look at, yeah, color dynamics. Give it to, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, uh -huh. We don't want to go up too much. I think five or so on that. You can see it is changing color. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, but you don't try want adding to... woods and not make it look more like a real forest. I mean, it's pretty close now. Now go into the size, the shape dynamics, and change the size. I do have it. Uh, oh, I'm using my mouse. I should be using my. I think no shape dynamics. Size shooter is way up. It should be very. His minimum size is pretty high. Oh, all right. Yeah, if I if I turn that down. Yeah. Yeah, this could be really good. So, uh, you know, you can use it, uh, you know, get the, the results you can get are, you know, I'm just boggles my mind what you can do with a brush. Mm -hmm. So, that's more than I know about this. <laughs> now, in Painter, you can make an image hose that does all that, but then you can change the uh, brush. You can have 15 different scans of trees and it'll alternate between the trees randomly. Yeah, and I, I think this one, you know, it doesn't go into that depth for the brush engine. Well, that's cool. So that's where I've been for the past month. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's your fault, Mike. You're the one that picked these brushes. <laughs> well, it's good for you. Yeah, right. I mean, I've spent the whole month doing this, just playing around. But it's, it, I mean, you get some really interesting effects. And if you wanted to paint in a background, where it wasn't as important, mm -hmm. uh, this kind of thing could be great. Yep. Maybe even filling in little bear patches where, where they're in the wrong spot. Yeah, yeah. Or covering up docks or uh, yep. canoe piles or wood piles. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Well, I want to welcome Judy, who uh, probably has been waiting longer than she would have liked. Oh. So did this meeting start at 7, or did I miss something? <laughs> started at 6, Judy. Oh, it started at 6. Sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. We talked about brushes. Hard to give them off. All that stuff. You can do a dab or a stroke, or you can use the mixer brush tool. Has anybody used the history brush tool? I've played with it some, but I mean, yeah, it it, it works. <laughs> Any? Can you show us uh, an example? Um, I don't have any. You know, I don't have any on me. <laughs> But you know, basically, all you do is pull up the history panel and put a check mark beside the history step that you want. And you know, you can just use the brush then to paint over the existing image on a separate layer, probably. Um, you just paint, and that will, you know, overlay whatever was on the image. The adjusted image or the, the state of the image as it is now. So, so what, why would you want to do that rather than just use the create a layer and then mask it in? That's probably an easier way to do it. No, but, 
as in Photoshop, there's a, you know a million ways to do anything, and right. that it's just another way to do it. And, and you know, if you look at some of what Alistair Ben does, he has a bunch of videos, and he demonstrates some of that. So, yeah, I watched uh, one of uh, Alistair Ben's uh, YouTube videos uh, a year ago on the art. Uh, history brush and there he was using it for cloning uh, for not cloning but for dodging and, and burning and when you go and it doesn't change anything except the uh, luminance uh, when you uh, dodge or burn with that and uh, but I I haven't gone back to it I will go back to it because uh, he makes an argument that it's the best way <laughs> to uh, dodge and burn. And certainly his results are fantastic, but I only tried it once. <laughs> yeah, well, any of the, you know, either Tony Kuiper or Greg Benz, either one of them or Jimmy McIntyre, they're, I guess, the three biggest luminosity masking experts out there. But, you know, they do it on a, a regular, um, you know, a, a, a blank layer. Um, and, you know, then they will use a soft light blend mode and just paint in a white or a dark or even a color to, you know, either darken or lighten or even change the, the uh, hue of the, the picture. Yeah, I am very curious why someone would go to all the trouble of doing a history brush to do that, to dodge and burn. Yeah. yeah. You'll have to go watch it and tell us. Yeah. <laughs> I've watched it and I'm going with the luminosity mask. Well, that's what I hear. Because, you know, what you can do is, is make a selection a luminosity selection rather than a mask. And then you have your dodge and burn layer and you paint with white on it to brighten only where the, the selection is made. And because the selection or luminosity selection is uh, self um, graduated, you know, you, you, you differentially paint light and dark so the lighter areas get lighter, and then you paint with the black and the darker areas will get darker if that's the selection that you have. So it, it really is a very, very controlled way to, to dodge and burn. And I really like it, and that's what I do. So I don't do the history brush. So I'm not going to watch that video again. <laughs> not going to watch it. <laughs> anyway. I think I would like to know what it's about. And I, I've not found a value in the history brush. Now the art history brush, has anybody used that? I Actually, used I can make the history brush work, but I can't make the art history brush work. So I don't understand the very, the differences. Have you taken art history? <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> the art history brush paints does the same thing as a history brush, but uses styles. So it grabs samples from the previous state, applies a style to it when you paint it. Did you have styles loaded? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm still trying to catch up with what you're describing. <laughs> Do you want to try it? Try you it. Can, Dude, I, you can, can you show us? I can try it. I do not, uh, let's see. I don't promise that it's gonna work. Let's grab that. And I'm gonna switch over to uh, a round brush. <laughs> <laughs> Just for fun. That we understand. <laughs> and, I'm selecting the art history brush. Oops. Go back to that. 
You should share your screen so we can see oh, what you're doing. I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You can see the reflection in your face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I grabbed that picture and I thought I had already shared the screen. So I picked the uh, round brush, simple one. I grabbed the history brush tool, art history brush tool. And let's pull a history out. So this is my history. I've done nothing to it. And it's got this little uh, check mark thing up here next to my initial level. So it's going to use that as a source, which seems really interesting since I haven't changed anything. And it's applying a tight short style, which that's not really nice. <coughs> um, loose curl long, how about that? Whoa. Let me if I turn that down. Is this the kind of thing you were getting? That's not nice either. Yeah, but uh, what do we... All right, this is better. This is tight long. Let me uh, go back. Open. Let's go to your history panel. I can do that. Can I do that? <laughs> oh, I can. All right, so I've got this small, tight, long style, and I'm just painting over stuff, and it's making it a little bit abstract. So, but you're limited to these styles as opposed to your brush dynamics. Is that correct? I think so. Isn't brush dynamics just part of a styles selection? I mean, that would, it's, it's kind of a grouping of things that you do to a brush. Right? Uh, well, the style is... Uh, go, go to your brush dynamics and see if you can change something. All right. Change, you know, change the, the color hue or something. Something will be dramatic. All right, this will be dramatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's we'll good. A bunch. That'll work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it works. It's even better. That's better? <laughs> I'm not sure why. Well, it's a creative that. technique. Oh, OK. We'll say effective. <laughs> Oh yeah, very realistic, <laughs> paisley kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so I I really have found no use for either the art history or. On that we agree. <laughs> Dab, look what Dab does. Oh, oh, my has a, a, a um, virus infection. What? The leaf looks like it has a virus infection. <laughs> it does. Leaf rust. <laughs> hey, Mike, I've got a picture I could show. That, uh, you know, and I, I think I submitted it to the last club meeting, but, you know, it will show, and it's more of a complete picture, you know, in a stylized way. All right. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out. Oh, there's a stop share button. There. Anyway, that's what art history brush will do. Obviously, you can do something else. Okay, this this is a. I probably ought to open this up in Photoshop because you can't see the underneath layers. It just takes forever to, oh, there it is. 
I'm going to close this. There it is. Um, got to move this out of the way again. Okay, I'm going to turn all these layers off. Okay, so this was my reference photo. That's what I started with. And then typical in painting, you do an underpainting where you just put in, you know, broad strokes. Um, and this one was created with what? This one was created with the same, this is whenever I watched the Lori Jill video and it was created with the mixer brushes. So um, I added some tree trunks just to give it some realism. Um, attached the use saturation to them. Um, I worked on the cabin individually, brought back some more detail. Is this with the history brush? No, no. This is all with, uh, you know, these are all layers. Uh, the technique that, that, you know, she talks about where you, you know, create, you duplicate the, the background layer um, you reduce the opacity to 1%, create a blank layer on top, merge the two, and then use a mixer brush on that layer. So this layer was created in that fashion. So okay. then I worked on the fence and did hand painting on it. Mm -hmm. I worked on the grass. You can see how much I changed that. So then, you start off by making a uh, blurry version and then a sharper, deep, sharper and sharper and sharper down to details. Yes. All right. And that's typically the way you work in, in natural media also. I did the sky. What else? I added some detail in the sky. I put the tree back in. Um, I think this was just a camera raw. I usually put a vignette on it. I put a, you know, warming filter, circular filter on the photo. And then I gave it a canvas texture. And if you zoom into any of this, you can actually, oops, I didn't want to do that. Um, you can actually see the brushwork in the fence, on the building, in the trees. You can see the canvas effect. So this was all done with that, you know, the, the technique that Lori Jill talks about um, in turning a photo into a painting. But you can spell see her name. What's that? How do you spell her name? L-O-R-I-J-I-L-L. -L. -L. Okay. Oh, Lori Jill. Okay. She has a full course on Udemy. And, you know, don't buy Udemy courses at full price. They're normally like 120 bucks. But they always, they always, always have sales. If you, you know, probably the most you'd have to wait is a week. And you can buy it for like $13 or something. Um, but I watched that course and then I tried my hand at that. So nice. this, this was, you know, whenever you compare it to... That you can see what a big difference the stylization does to it. Okay, I'll stop sharing if I can find it there. And the advantage of doing that or just pushing a paint filter is that it actually uses strokes and uses intelligence to put detail in the right spots. Uses your intelligence to do that. Yes. <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> or lack thereof. <laughs> so, Ken, you were talking about using the smudge tool with brushes? Well, I, I, well the reason I brought it up was, uh, was because 
I have seen photographs that had been turned into these very beautiful, smooth, high uh, pictures of dogs with their hair and stuff. And apparently, and it's called a, the smudge technique. And of course, I can see how you could do that with a smudge tool. If you made the tool really small and, and spent the kind of time that Rich does on, on, <laughs> on a photograph, which I don't have patience for. But I think, I, does anybody know how this smudge technique works? I haven't. No. I, I suspect it'd be like with the mixer tool, where yeah. you do little strokes and it samples the color and smears it with what's underneath. Mm -hmm. uh, that set of Lori Jill videos, she does a number of ways to turn a photograph into a painting. And one of the ways she does it is that smudge technique. I didn't see the use in that. It, you know, it just looked blurry to me um, rather than, you know, a more stylized type of painting. Sure. Well, I think we've really uh, gone over brushes. Is there anything else we want to talk about on brushes? Well, we haven't really gone into, people are talking about mixing brushes, mixer brushes. Can we get a quick demo of how that, I'm, I'm thinking of a brush that blends paint. That's the paint, it turns your photograph into um, just laid down paint. And then when you run a brush across it, it smears all the colors that you're pushing it through. I can show you something simple. Yeah, oh, that would be. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right, let's see. Got that. Let me share the screen. Full size. Go away. Let's get that one. Oh no, let's get something colors. All right. Um, I experimented with a mixer brush. Let's see. It's like a mix mixer brush tool. So that's over here under the brushes. Then I'm going to grab uh, just a simple round brush again. Why is my, oh my history sitting in the air? So with the mixer brush, you go in up here in the, the top uh, toolbar, you can select, you can specify the size of the brush, pick the brush, give it some dynamics. Uh, you got your, your foreground color, and then let's see, this one is clean the floor. What is this one? Mm. Load the brush. Yeah, load the brush uh, before each stroke. And this one is clean the brush after each stroke. So okay. if you painted through green, it wipes that out and pick, goes back to your normal color. Let's, uh, well, let's, let's give it Mike, if you just want to use the uh, mixer brush without adding any color, just click off that first icon, the one that said load brush, go to the left mm -hmm. there. Click that one. And now it's a pure, it's a mixer brush and it will, it will mix whatever's on there. All right. And you can see it mixing here. And if you turn the other button on, you'd be adding that green in. Let's add that in. Make it healthier leaf. Oh, it's doing too much. And you so, can you can choose uh, the styles. Yeah. It seems take to be a pretty flow, good one. Take the flow down from a hundred percent. That's probably what. You do. All right. Yeah. What is this doing?
maybe take that down a little bit too or change this to a different color. Give it a brownish. But this is mixing the two. Sample. So you've got these sets that will, or you've got wetness, uh, which is uh, how much color the brush picks up from the canvas. You've got load, which is how much color is loaded into the reservoir, of which a, a small amount will run out quickly. You've got mix, which is the ratio of canvas to reservoir colors. All right, so we want to turn that one down or up. This would be mostly canvas colors. And even, this is just blurry. It's not really giving us a nice long. Yeah, to increase the wetness. That, that'll, you'll really see its effect then. Ooh. Maybe not. <laughs> no, I can see it. It's, it's better now. It's a lot more obvious now. It's flowing? Yeah. <laughs> Run it across the stem, perpendicular to the stem. It's kind of out. Yeah. yeah, it depends on where you start and whether you're dragging the white in or the green out. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so there, if there's a technique to doing this, uh, we turn those off. We get anything? This is my problem with with brushes. There's so damn many things you can do with it. Yes. I get confused where I am. <laughs> well, somebody was suggesting that if you use the moist, that that's a good place to start. Maybe a moist, heavy mints. But it seems to be just blurry. At least that's what it looks like to me. But, Maybe so I should be the can you do this on a, di on, a, on a second layer, a blank layer, and then change the blend modes? All right, let's try that. Let's grab a different leaf. Let's grab that one. Paint up here. I've got sample all layers selected. So, if I go in and kind of, it's like just rubbing them out. Yeah, this is like a blur tool or something. And that's what it looks like. It's really not exciting yet. Let's see. Let's try a moist light mix. I, that does something, but it it's sampling the color and just smearing it through. Well, it's because it's using your background color a lot. Get that gold. What if I made that blue? Not for prettiness, but just to show something different. All right. So it is sampling the pixels right where I start and then repeating them. You can see that there. Well, it's like taking a, a, a paintbrush that doesn't have any paint on it and going to a oil painting that you've just finished where all the paints on the, on the, are, are wet. And so you're using you're using your brush to smear one color into the next, and it's wherever you drop the brush that color is what's being smeared. What if we switch to very wet mode? 
that's not nice. <laughs> now you're bringing that blue in. Yeah, you're bringing the, turn the blue off. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, with a dirty paintbrush, it says blue on it. <laughs> I clean it every time. And then, which, let's see. Wet is, no. Mix is a ratio of canvas to reservoir. So I want it to be 100% mix. That's going to take only colors from the surface here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not impressed by it. <laughs> yes, Mike, I've, I've, got, I've, I've, got, I've got one that I can demo, you know, right. a picture. Great. For a mixer brush? Yeah. Great. I will release it. There. Before you do that, just to let you guys know, I got to go. I got a pre previous appointment, but wow, my mind is spinning from the brushes at this point in time. <laughs> I'm going to have to play a lot, I think. Yeah. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Bye. Good night. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Um, nice cabin. Yeah, <laughs> I wish I owned it. <laughs> anyway, um, with this brush, this is one of Tao Webster's, uh, it started off as a palette knife, but you can see what it's doing to the colors here. It's not overdoing it, you know, but it, you can see what it's, you know, how it's smearing the colors. Uh huh. You can see if you make little waves in it, you will get waves in your, uh, you know, the result. All right. So your settings are 47% wet, 22% load, 56% mix, 54% flow. Yes. All right. And that's clean the brush after each stroke? Yes. And some of the, you know, brush tip, I take my spacing down usually when I'm using a painting. Um, otherwise, it, it, it looks blotchy. Um, shape dynamics. Oh, I have pen pressure turned on, so I should probably use my pen rather than the mouse. Um, and I do scattering, right. do images. I do texturize and the transfer, um, may as well turn that off. It does nothing. Uh, none of the settings were set, but um, you know, you can. So you, maybe because you gave all those dynamics in there, that's what makes it much more interesting. Uh, you, can, you, know, you can do some Really, and, and if I were laying down a base color, maybe I'd do it this way. Um, but that's working right on the actual image. Mm -hmm. Oh, what if you uh, put a blank level above it? Um, let me try that. I got to get these people out of the way here. They're always in the most inconvenient place. <laughs> Just hit the, hit the single line and it'll go down to one picture. What, what, hit what? The single line at the top of the, uh, this? it'll go down to one, a single, single person showing. The person <laughs> at the very top of the, the panel, oh, it's got all the people in it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but rather than just put a blank layer, let me, uh, I don't see your green coming into this picture at all. My oh, green it turned off. It, it's turned off. Where? Um, let me go down here and this is, this is doing that magic with the, uh, um, 
creating a layer. Ah, it's gone. Try it again. Eh. <laughs> I guess that's not going to work. <laughs> There it is. Nope. Stop. The move okay. command is not currently available. Yeah, but yeah. So right now I'm actually, you know, painting on this uh, painting layer that I created. And you can see I'm smearing the paint here. So in this case, you can take the opacity down if you want to bring back some detail. Um, yes, I could, but if How I kept working, your sample all layers is turned off. It should be for this particular technique because the painting, the one that says painting layer, yeah. it's actually two layers. It is a duplicate of the bottom background layer and the opacity of that layer is at 1%. And there's a blank layer above it, opacity at 100%. And you merge the two layers. And, you know, this painting layer actually now has that 1% of color buried underneath or invisible, basically. But whenever you use the, uh, the mixer brush, it operates at 100% because the opacity of the entire layer is 100. Turn so off the bottom layer. Turn off the bottom layer. It does not. Well, it does. I, so this is, you're saying this is 1%? This, yeah, this blank, what looks like blank, the uh -huh. checker is not. It's actually 1% of the color of the original. So it gives you a place to sample the appropriate color layer and then how much of it you put down is dependent on your brush. Yes, exactly. So this that, is, that's an interesting approach, Rich. Yeah, it, it, it really is pretty tricky. And, uh, but you can see how you can act. And if I took smaller strokes, of course I wouldn't be smearing the paint. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter if I use this technique and smear the paint on this painting layer, as I call it. Or if I go to the original and turn this layer off and go back here, and then got to select it, then I can smear this layer. Hmm. But you you maintain the integrity of your reference layer with this other technique. Right. So anyway, that's the uh, mixer brush and how you can actually get it to smear paint. Now, what did, how did you make that painting layer again? Okay, let me get rid of this. Okay, control J. Yeah. Um, I can duplicate the bottom layer. And then you can click on this little icon to create a blank layer above it. Yeah. So this layer, you turn down the opacity to 1%. Yeah. Hmm. Gotta turn this one off. Uh -huh. um, then you select these two layers and merge them. That's how I created that painting layer. And now if I paint, the bottom layer is not selected. This one is. That is amazing. Magic. It, it yes, really that is magic. magic. <laughs> and Photoshop used to have an action to do that, but you know, I just what I just went through, I created my own action. One percent opacity. Merge that with a blank layer, and you, and it just works. Duplicate the layer. Set the opacity to 1%, create a blank layer, merge it with the 1% opacity, and paint on it. But, but it's not using the base layer anymore. It's just not, using... not at all. 
You know, there are some techniques that up here, if you click on sample all layers, but I'm told that's a uh, much more uh, compute intensive way to do things. Well, so you, have, yeah, you could have a dozen layers that it would have to yeah. work on. Yes. So, you know, this kind of obviates the need for that. So when you make a dozen layers with different things, Yes. Do you create each layer the same exact way? Yes. Yeah, and whenever you layer them, you know, like if I created another one of these layers on top, if I painted on it, it would overlay this one unless you use a different blend mode. So, you know, there's, you have blend modes that can play into that too. So, okay, I'll stop sharing. Next year. Well, that was magic too. Yeah. Well, you watch that Hardy Fowler video if you want to see magic. Wow. All right. Anything else about brushes? If you go to our resources page on the club website, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There's about twelve different resources there. There's some places to get free brushes. There's how to use uh, how to do the custom blender brush that I think that's what Ann was describing last time. Blake Rudis' stuff. There's oil painting, uh, a mixer brush technique, which is even different from what Rich was just showing. Uh, there's several things about turning uh, photographs into paintings using the mixer brush. Uh, and I'll try and put up the Alistair Blend thing. And uh, actually, Rich, if you have links to those Udemy classes uh -huh. and the Alistair Blend video, was that uh, YouTube? Yes. You send those to me. I'll put those on there too. Okay. So uh, these are pretty cool. All right, let's see. Kids and their toys. Yeah. I know. Especially now when it's snowy and about yeah. anyway. And we don't need Corel to do this. No. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> but with Corel, you can do amazing things. Uh, all right. Um, I, we're up to the point of looking at the finish it photo. So what did you guys do with the knights? Who's got a picture? I do. I've okay. got one. Let's see what you got. Okay. I'll and, me. And, oops. What did I? Here, there you go. There we go. <laughs> I changed it. Uh, what? What? It's uh, just <laughs> okay. That, of course, is the, my raw conversion. And obviously, we have to get rid of the background and, and probably the foreground. And so I've uh, downloaded this. I spent <laughs> more than, well, I spent parts of two days trying to find uh, images to go to use for a background. And uh, whereas Mike uh, uh, had come up with a, a Renaissance uh, image, I, I, I didn't find one that I liked. So I went with this. And then uh, first try, uh, just using the original background. Then I got interested in uh, color grading and uh, change the clouds to this magenta or fuchsia or purple, whatever. 
And then the question is whether to have the subject uh, in color or in, or well, okay, no, I'm back to where I'm changing the uh, background again. And then once I uh, have this uh, white clouds, then I wanted to uh, change the uh, uh, nights to uh, monochrome. And that uh, works pretty well, I think. And then I continued to play around and uh, I like that one the best of all, I think. Yeah, this is, mm -hmm. this is one of my favorites. And here I did split toning, but uh, that would leave some blue in the uh, night. So I uh, desaturated the nights and I'm back to black and white here. But I, initially I thought that they would blend better if I uh, uh, left blue in the nights, but I don't know. But uh, but that is the best one, I think. It's no. real nice. It, yeah. it is very nice. Did you have a, a feeling for what you wanted to say with it, uh, a vision? Yeah, I just wanted, uh, well, I wanted it to be uh, an abstract uh, and fine art. Uh, and, and uh, I want a strong gra uh, graphic uh, graphic uh, image, and uh, I think that uh, well, I've spent a lot of time here in the last month uh, working with uh, well, all the different techniques that I have to learn here, <laughs> and. Uh, so, there you go. Uh, yeah, I think that's, it's very good as far as getting that graphic. Uh, I, I, I don't think it, it having uh, the subject in color works at all when you've got the monochrome background. Right. Very good. And I've been brushing around the, the feet here of the uh, night in the, to the, that was facing us. <clears throat> and that's about all I did. So I, I have yet to do anything with clip masks and uh, textures, but I've been working on that. But so, I, I had fun with this. <laughs> and I'm glad that uh, it went over pretty well. To me, this is like uh, ancient Norse gods. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Nice guys fighting against. Dueling in the clouds. Yes. Uh huh. Very nice. Well, thank you. So that's, I'll close down unless you have some questions. Let's see. Who else? Who else had a picture? I have one. Great. All right, let me try to share. All right. <laughs> so this is, uh, so I had wanted to kind of keep the, this, so there's a few versions here, but I wanted to try to keep your nights as kind of the focus of the scene, but I was gonna integrate it, them into a uh, battle um which required that i go find some other source material um the other uh fighters here they're from there's two um sources one i would one is from the colorado renaissance fair in 2011 and then the other one is from the uh, knights of the tempest shoot in 2018 um so I, well let me see i can you can see there's a lot of layers here with the individuals yeah. in there. Um, let me go back to the 
So this is kind of the first version. It's a little hazy. That's it's kind of deliberate. Um, what I wanted to was to get kind of a dusty or hazy feel. Um, but what I didn't do was try to add, you know, the dust coming off of like you know horses' hooves or things like that, which probably would have made it a little bit more um, realistic. Um, for the uh, the Renaissance fair ones, actually, you can see that there's actually this guy appears one, two, three, four times. <laughs> this guy appears twice. Um, if you were, and then the other ones I think are all, well, actually this guy, I don't remember if he, he might actually be one of the, like this guy again. So maybe he's five times. <laughs> um, I did have to cut all these out. That was labor intensive, but the other trick, the other problem I had was I didn't know what I had to work with. So, um, put them all in, uh, put in their shadows. I didn't quite match it up. The way I did that was I took the cutouts, turned them to black, compressed them this way uh, vertically. Uh, originally, I didn't compress them enough. Put them back in. That's not quite completely accurate because especially with the horses or something, or uh, like if somebody's got his feet spread out, it doesn't quite work, right? Because you, if his feet are like kind of parallel with the, the frame, then it works. But then if they're not, then you have to kind of start tweaking stuff um, to get something that looks okay. And then I did put some, find a way to fake some texture into the shadows because of the grassy background. Um, I do have, I think I've got some castle picture somewhere. Um, I didn't go and scan it. Um, so this picture is from uh, Ship Rock, New Mexico. So this is a ship, the Ship Rock, it's Northwest New Mexico. Um, but it had kind of a the grass that kind of blended in with the, uh, the grass that you had. It, it, you know, it's not entirely convincing, but it's kind of close. So that's why I ended up choosing this picture. And then I have two variations from this. These are saturated. So one of the one of the things was I when I planned this, I didn't plan this very well. You know, when I put these pictures in, they were all from JPEG. If I'd known where I was going with it, I probably should have pre-adjusted them all from raw to get kind of the hue I was you know going for. But I didn't. These two here are kind of, um, well, one was more improvised than the other one. This one was more improvised. Um, so this one has a poster edge and posterization and uh, a lot of the um, saturation has been brought up. I did have to change the sky back up to the original because otherwise with the filter, you get like spots in the sky. And originally I saved this and labeled it as comic book but later when I was thinking about this, you know, um, maybe if you, you know, like, uh, if you were to do more work on this, you could make it feel more like stained glass, mm -hmm. um, which would probably be more, you know, appropriate to the period where this is representing. Uh, the other one, which I was thinking of almost originally, but I didn't maybe go as far as, I put this on canvas texture, but the idea was to maybe get something that was more like tapestry, so. Actually, Albert, I think that you you brought these together and made them look like they go together as opposed to, you know, one layer on top of another. Wow. Yeah, I well, I tried to pick um, some interesting scenes. And actually, you know, if you wanted to make this more of a battle scene, it's like, you know, as I said, it would be nice to, you know, added some uh, more dust or something and maybe not have hazed this out so much, you know, to, to kind of give it that feel and even to have more soldiers. But then of course, I'd have to cut out more soldiers <laughs> to, to put in here, <laughs> which is like, after a while I was like, oh yeah, that's enough. Um, so. Yeah, I think it's very effective. It's, it really yeah. is, you know, it comes across really well. Yeah. yeah. I like that final basic one the best the, just just this yeah and the yeah. So that, that's where you know that's where i started and then i as i said i went to these other two i um 
increase in the saturation. And, you know, as I said, that was kind of not good planning on my part. You know, it, been, it would have been better if like, oh, I'd say, oh, I adjust the saturation this way first and then dull it down, back down to this. Because what happened, of course, is um, you got a lot of noise. Like if I blow up the sky here, you'll see that it's kind of noisy. And when I put this filter in, it was so bad that, you know, I, you start seeing black spots in the sky because of how this filter works. And so I said, okay, we'll just take the, put the original sky back in. Um, but yeah, so that's, that was my idea to, to kind of put these guys into a, a larger battle scene, but to, uh, to kind of keep them in the front, keep them, you know, as the, keep them in the center the of focal it. Seat, point of the scene right i think that worked really well All right thank you and the shadows i think are a huge part of selling it yeah it it doesn't look right if you don't have the shadows um there there are some things here i mean i could point out um i mean other other than you know me not you know thinking ahead about like what, how i was going to do the colors and pulling them on jpeg if you were to look at the lighting it's kind of not right um, these guys are, your guys were lit, I think almost from the top, right? That's why you see right. this shadow here, right? These guys, um, the Renaissance Fair guys, they were actually lit almost from going into the screen. The sun was like, it's like behind us, right? From our point of view. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see that in some of the reflections here. I darkened some of these guys down almost to say like, okay, well, the sun's up here. But then if you were to kind of look at you know, reflections like this, it's like, it's not, uh, it's not matched. But I mean, I had to get soldiers from somewhere. I had to get knights from somewhere, right? So, okay, I said, okay, we'll just go with that. The, uh, I think the um, Knights of the Tempest, they were probably maybe a better match in terms of the lighting. Um, if I remember how this, it kind of depends which way we were shooting, but I think a lot of the sh shots were going to the west and it was in the afternoon. So at least the sun was a little bit more behind them and above. So the Knights of the Tempest one, that's one, two, this is actually a woman here and then three and the rest of them are from uh, Renaissance Fair. I think you did a great job. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, good. Thanks. Anybody else? I've got one I can show. Let's see. So the original picture, that was an athletic competition. They really were. It's like a boxing match or a wrestling match. And uh, it's not the story that I wanted to tell. It just wasn't, that wasn't as, in, it was interesting, but I wanted to have a knight defending his castle against some other attacking knights and uh, I didn't have a castle, but I got a picture of the uh, uh, monastery or the chapel on the rock up by Estes Park. So I put that in the back and then I add some fire, some flames from a campfire. And uh, then I, I actually, I took the background layer and gave it a, a Rembrandt filter in topaz to give it a little bit of abstraction so I could concentrate my the interest on these two uh, knights. And so then I laid them in. I sampled some of the orange color so that's shining off their armor. Painted in, painted some of that in, painted in some grungy texture on, on the shiny armor bits to make it more like they weren't just clean armor out fighting. It's like 
they've been fighting in, in a war. And then I added uh, a uh, tintype border around the edge. And that kind of, I like the nice abstract look around the edge. And I liked how it tied the dark regions together. Mm -hmm. So I was, my whole thing here was try to get something that's more medieval fighting for a reason. There. Attacking with the monastery and defending the monastery. Good vision. Yeah. Poor defense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's he fighting for? The castle's on fire. <laughs> well, somebody else should be putting that out. <laughs> I would put the Pooter Fire Authority on that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to ask for a critique on this. What would you do differently? There is one element of the photo that bothers me a little bit. And that's the sword blades. They're the color. They almost look like they're transparent. You can see the uh, yeah the slate roof through the blade. I think that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you are. I think what I did is yeah, yeah. I gave everything a little bit of the Rembrandt uh, filter. And I painted it back out, and I must not have painted it out on the blade as much. Huh? Mm. Or maybe it's because it was so white. But yes, I agree with that. I, I think this is you did a really good job in this, Mike. I think I find the the far left hand side, that straight line of the tin type uh, border a little distracting. Um but other than that, I mean, this, this ties together really well. You think the straightness of that shape? Yeah, just that one, it looks like there's a, you know, a, a, maybe another sword or something in there. Uh, right. Yeah, I see your point. Okay. It looks very organic up to that point. But, it, but it's, you know, that's a, it's a minor detail. Uh, I'd like to point out something for Dave Farney. Yeah. Uh, uh, when, when he was doing the same image uh, and he ended up not liking the color, um, I think it, it would have benefited if he had done just what, uh, just what you did, and that is pick the highlights off the blade and off the helmets, you know, go to, to zone 10 and 9. Um, if you select those zones and then paint in a little of the background or the sky color, because those are areas that would be, would have glint from the sky color. And it would, it would make the, uh, the background and the nights blend better. And you don't have to put, you know, you don't want to put a color filter over the whole thing, just, just the uh, shiny parts. <laughs> you know, I think, I think that, you know, you really did a great job putting all that together, you know, and it pulls it off really well, but it just seems a little heavy on the left side, you know, it, uh, you know, there's something about balance in the photo. You heavy know, on the left or heavy on the right? Eh, it might be on the right, but, you know, but it seems out of balance or something. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I think that I think that actually adds to the tension in the in the fight. Yep. Ooh. I'll say that was my intent. <laughs> Rich, are you talking about the three vertical columns there? Um, that might be it. You know, it it just <coughs> you know just the balance to me in and. and Ken loves it because it's so dark. <laughs> it's a little too dark for me. Um, 
So I would like something a little happier. So those col those aren't really columns, they're windows, aren't they? Yeah. So yeah. Right. Oh, really? So they could be lightened up just a hair and it to bring that balance that you're looking for back. Yeah. All right. Um, actually, if they're windows, they should probably be glinting with the light of the fire. Yeah. I was going to say, either either glinting with the light of the fire, or if you want to make it even more dramatic, that there's fire inside the building and then they're lit up from, hey, from yeah. behind. Because oh, the, the window <laughs> on the left side of the chapel is lit. It is. Yeah, I couldn't understand when you first showed the photograph what all that black stuff in the top right corner was. Um, and yeah, it took me a long time to realize those were not three columns just introduced to the picture, but they were actual three tall windows in the, in the chapel. I like the idea of adding some glint to that one, to the three windows, yeah. some shining off. Yeah, and that, that might fix the, you know, the balance for me. You know, it's just too heavy one way or the other. And, and like Jim said, it's, it's probably that dark corner. It's now, the left side, it's smoky. There's, I don't have anything there. I yeah. could have the faint outline of a tree. Maybe it's just empty. We could carry a flame up on the far left side. Up again, all right. I, I, I don't know if I, I'd put anything up there. I think that sort of adds to the mystery of it. The heavy gradient from light on the left to pure black on the, on the right. I think that does add the, that's the drama. Um, so don't get rid of all of it. That's right. Sure. Did you consider showing a little more detail in the armor suit of the fellow on the left? You mean his like chest area, the leather? In the back. Or the metal? You know, the one who has his back to us. Uh-huh. All right. It's all. I can see where the other one is sort of backlit, but this one seems like it might need it. I'd like to see a little more detail. A little more detail in? In the like suit. The chest area or? In the, in the back of the guy on the left. Gotcha. Ann, are you talking about maybe bright uh, making it a little less dark so that you can see the yeah. buckles and the straps yeah. and stuff better. Yeah, yeah. All right. I don't know. It's just a thought. Did you look sure. at that to see what it what it looks like? <laughs> I can certainly do that. I kind of do like the large dark areas being tied together around the edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. No. How did you select out the knots? What did you do to select them from the original photo? Oh, what was, what'd you say? How did you select them from the original photo so you could mask them? Oh, I used uh, Topaz Remass. It's an old version of Topaz. It's a really nice selection tool. Should I have added more grit? You know, like there's these patches of black just in the sky and in the flame. Like down Maybe here. more smoke. More smoke around them? Oh, no, behind them. Don't, you know, don't, I, you know, the fire's behind them. And the, and the, that gray, is that gray in the top 
left smoke or yeah yeah so you got white smoke it it looks more like a texture to me it's smoke that's been through a Rembrandt filter oh, okay. I bet you guys would love to see yeah. I, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily have identified that as smoke. Right. Um, I didn't realize it was smoke actually until somebody said it just now. Now, if I darken down, just slightly darken down that uh, up, upper left corner. I don't, that might just look like you try to vignette it. I there might be, you know, something else that you would, you know, you could do to make it more convincing that it was smoke. Because I I kind of agree. It's like if you if I just look at it, it's like it's not immediately obvious. If, if you wanted to convey that it was smoke there, it's not immediately obvious to me. It it could be yeah. As um, I think Anne was saying, it's just a texture, but. If you wanted, and if if that's what you wanted, then like okay, that's fine. But if if you wanted to say that that smoke, it's like I could look at it for a while, and maybe say yeah, okay. It's if I look kind of toward the roof or something, it's like yeah, okay, maybe that is smoke. But yeah, smoke doesn't usually have texture, but it has structure. You know, it's on a larger scale, mm -hmm. and so this looks kind of in between those two. Well, and like I said, what I did is I took all the background layer and ran through a Rembrandt filter. Yeah. Maybe I should have done less in the smoke. Well, I don't know what, what did the Rembrandt filter do other than change the color? Oh, actually, what it does is it goes in and repaints everything. It does samples and strokes and it paints that whole place. These are all little paint strokes making it up. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, maybe more um, contrast within the smoke, not not the smoke to the paint or to the photograph. Should I have something showing through partly, mm -hmm. like the top of a tree? No, I don't think you need that. The the most convincing part of the smoke, if it's smoke, <laughs> is how it apparently billows out of the rafters of the church. Mm -hmm. You know up above the cross swords. It mm -hmm. looks like it's coming out, out of the church there. Mm -hmm. And if you could emphasize that a little more, that would make the, the, the viewer say, ah, that's smoke coming out of the church. Right. Yeah. Or coming out of the windows. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure that adding that extra detail to the background doesn't, isn't gonna distract from the, the main subject. No. It's all matter of taste. <laughs> yes. True. Yeah. But yeah, it looks pretty good to me. What, it's yeah. good to hear what other people think. <laughs> or then again, you could do nothing. It's just fine. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. it looks fine. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything that they want to have people talk about? Any Boy, I have something, Mike, but after you guys showed these nights, I, mine's going to be sort of trivial. Uh, it's, not, it's not the nights, but it's something that... All right. That, uh, let me share this. And our goal here is to help each other out. Yeah. Maybe nothing is trivial can you yeah. can you see that mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay so this was this was actually a shot that i took many years ago of lake michigan and the colors in lake michigan have started to sort of change based on the you know the water chemistry and the quagga mussels etc cetera, etc cetera. and and i didn't know what to do with it but i love the colors and so I, I've been trying to think about what I can use this for. 
And the other day it dawned on me that I also had uh, some pelicans that I shot in, uh, uh, actually in Gulfport in Alabama. And I thought, well, you know, a pelican could fly over the water. And so I tried to do a composite of those two pictures. And this is what oh. I came up with. Um, nice. And that I, I used, uh, uh, it's so long ago, I probably, I think I used a topaz filter to do the painting and the, of the water. And then I overlaid the pelican. And I started out with the pelican being much larger, but the larger it is, the more it just looks pasted on. So I decreased the size and to try and get it to fit in and use it different blending modes to, to get the color to come through and the color to, you know, to met things to line up. Um, but I was, I was pretty happy with this as, as sort of a painting from a photograph. Um, but I'm open to suggestions or, or, or help. How did you get the paint strokes? Actually, I, th I, like I said, Mike, this was a long time ago. I think that this was a topaz filter, uh, you know, an acrylic uh, filter. And obviously I vignette, vignetted it pretty heavily um, to get the, uh, the effect of a the sunrise or a sunset, uh, probably a sunrise more because it's Lake Michigan. But, uh, um, the paint stroke, I, you know, I like the colors. I like the, the paint strokes. Um, I, I'm still not totally happy with the way the bird lays in. I think it's very nice. Yes. I like it too. Yeah. I think the size of the pelican is, if it were big, it, you have a big scene. Right. It, you know, it's a, that's a pretty large ex expanse that you're looking at. So the bird can't be real big. So you, I thought you sized it pretty nicely. Did Thanks. you try doing a silhouette? I'm sorry? Did you try doing a silhouette on the uh, I did. I did try to, I, I did try silhouette and I did, you know, you, you just, you don't have enough to recognize it as a pelican. That's all. And maybe you don't have enough even at this size, but since I know it's a pelican, it's a pelican. Well, it's clearly a pelican. That's not, I don't think you need to worry about that. I, I have one uh, comment about the, the water itself. Um, yes. This is, uh, I, think, I think what you're getting at here is a, a very calm and tranquil scene at sunrise. Um, but the water, to me, kind of looks choppy. I know it's because it's the, the technique that- Because followed. of the, the paint strokes, right? Yeah, and yeah. I was wondering if you could, uh, there's, a, there's a smear where you could smear it horizontally. Yep. You, 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 could, you could make it so it was, looked like more calm water. Okay. Um, this, this doesn't look calm, it looks choppy. Mm -hmm. I like the strokes myself. Yeah, I do too. I think if you made that real calm, it would it would not fit in with the rest of the picture. Um, you know, I think it carries a a theme. You know, the strokes carry a, a, a theme through the whole image, and I don't know that that would add to it to subtract them from just the water. Did you try doing any kind of abstraction on the uh, pelican, giving it some strokes, some finer uh, detail? He does have some. He he is stroked actually, <laughs> but I tried I tried to do that to take out some of the detail, Mike, because the more the more detail that he has in there, the more it looks like he's just pasted on top. Mm -hmm. I think the color matches real well. One thing about the, the strokes is um, at the horizon line, 
So if you told me, is this water, just water out to the horizon or if there's no, it's water like it, well, land in the background, right? The, That's the, it, right. The picture starts out as just water all the way to the horizon, but you're right that it after the stroking, the paint strokes, it does look like there is mountains out there in the yeah. very far yeah. distance. Yeah. Which I wasn't unhappy with, but okay. that wasn't the that wasn't the initial intent. I, I thought it was mountains. Actually, I think it looks like there's beach out to where the blue starts. And then okay. there's mountains on the other side of the lake. Okay, let me go back to, um, this doesn't even look like it's in focus. Um, and I'm sure it was, but uh, this is actually sort of silt in the first third of the picture. And then you get the transition of water to the horizon and then sky. And when you add the strokes, because the strokes are so coarse, you obviously lose that detail. Um, so the foreground really is sand, not water. No, no, it's, well, it's, it's silt in the water. That's why oh. it's gray. OK. I like the looks of it, though. Yeah, I think so do I. Even well, if maybe the topography is different from what it really was. <laughs> I like the way you made mountains out of the <laughs> yeah, all right. Out of water. Thanks. Thank you all. <laughs> that was it. Anybody else want, have a picture they want to show? This is one thing that could be really helpful. It's helpful to me. Me too. Because I, I get other people's thoughts and they think totally different things sometimes. And they're legitimate. So, so just for my education, so we're trying to do some kind of art, fine art type stuff or what? what what's the <laughs> idea here? <laughs> well, maybe we're not succeeding then. Yes, we are. Okay. We are making fine art images. In yeah. the eye of the beholder. Exactly. <laughs> but exactly. they don't have to be paintings, right? Right. No. It could be a picture of a uh, an airplane. It doesn't even have to start with a photograph, right? All right. Uh, there's a big question. Is photography art? Or for the craft? <laughs> We are the camera club, though. <laughs> so does anybody think that photography is not art? Can be. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then the bigger question is, can photography be fine art? If you look that up on the internet, you get people that say, oh, there's seven kinds of fine art, and photography is not one. Yeah, well, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Here, here. <laughs> we are the fine art six. So we should probably. I have one I can share. Really? All right, go for it. Okay. Let me get... Let's see, figure out how to share my screen. And just to clarify, we are fine art, which means we may do a lot more processing than others. Okay. So here, here's my attempt at fine art. Right. <laughs> well. There you go. Can you see that? Uh huh. I'm not quite sure I'm sharing, right? I sh you I are. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. It's either an ocean or a reef or oh. mold. Mold. Yeah. On it. It's a bowl with a stem of a leaf in it. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> what is it? It's fine art. Can't you tell? <laughs> uh <-huh>. Yes. <laughs> No, it's actually um it's um it's an old um, um bird bath that was um sitting mm -hmm. in my backyard that doesn't have water in it anymore uh -huh. <clears throat> that's been kind of decolored and stuff so but no. i don't know with fine art <laughs> you have a vision it's, it's interesting to look at 
It's interesting. So it'll it'll qualify. It does it qualify mind, as fine qualify. art? <laughs> Don't know what the hell it is to start yeah. with. But yeah. It, right. Yeah. It, yeah. It's that, that may be it's true. It's like abstract. we didn't. Yeah. Well, if you put if you frame this and put it up on your wall, when you had people over and they saw it, would you have a discussion for ten minutes about what it is? Probably. <laughs> yeah. No, put a fancy signature on it, Judy, and oh, oh, nobody right. will even question my, it. Put my signature on it. Yeah, Judy, remember, if it doesn't look like art, just print larger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, anyway. Oh, no. Very nice. The thing I like about that is it was abstract enough that I didn't know what it was. Nobody did, right. And we could, we could sit there and talk for an hour. If, yeah. if you weren't there, we could talk for an hour trying to figure out what it is. And that's <laughs> a great thought. Yeah, bird bath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bird bath. It, is what it is, is that important? No. As opposed the to the, the and color the and the shape and yeah. composition. <laughs> I think the interest, just the interest in trying to figure out what it is, the puzzle, makes that fine art. Okay. What was your intent for it? Uh, my intent? Um, I didn't have a whole lot of intent. I was just going around taking pictures of interesting things. All right. It was interesting. You found yeah. it interesting. I did too. I think you succeeded there. Judy, it'll never be fine art unless you go to fine art school <laughs> and, and harvest all the adjectives that you can describe that in <laughs> my art. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll work on that, Ken. Thanks. <laughs> Do you remember visiting the uh, fine, the uh, some <laughs> fine arts <laughs> thing? Uh, photography. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And just making fun of the pictures. For those of you who are newer to the club, you really missed something. The uh, arguments that went on between the curator of that muse museum and. Uh, some of us schmucks in the in the club. <laughs> but it's not in focus. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yes, that was fine art. Okay, I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get what fine art is. So some people uh, do not agree. Look on the internet; you'll see a few yeah. drinks. Okay. But think about oh Andy Warhol's Campbell soup can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about that JPEG that sold for $68 million <laughs> last week? Yeah. Yes. That's got to gotta be fine art. You just have to get 69,000 of your photos and collage them, and you too could sell it for right. <laughs> But you just buy a JPEG file. Yeah. Yeah. I know. That's nuts. <laughs> How do you display the thing? <laughs> He's laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah. <laughs> Post it on Facebook. Someone with a little too much money. Yeah. 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 I was thinking of trying, I, I was talking to my wife today about that. And we, we, we both came to the conclusion, I want to be in on the conversation where the guy is trying to, to tell an insurance company that it's, he wants to insure it for $68 million. <laughs> well, he'll have the appraisal. Yeah. All right. I wanted to add a new section on uh, what, what project are you working on now? Hmm. Like, I've spent the month pretty much looking at Corel Painter because I want to be able to paint more abstract, interesting backgrounds. And it's it's an amazing tool. I've been spending the month working on brushes, right? In Photoshop. And I have Real Painter 2019, I think. But I mean, every year they come out with a new version, and you got to spend the same as you would on Photoshop. So why not just use Photoshop? So oh. It, have you tried Fresco? I, I, I played with it once. Uh, 
I've been playing with it on my iPad and you know it's worth it's worth looking at because it has some of the same brush brush features and mm -hmm. some additional sort of blending techniques. Um, and it comes with your with your monthly subscription to Adobe. Called Fresco? Fresco, Adobe Fresco. Hmm. Hmm. Where is, is I've never seen it. Well, you can load it. I, I, is it just an iPad application? Oh, okay. I don't know the answer to that. It might be, might be for uh, just tablets. Do you do it on your tablet? I do, yeah. Okay. Is it a, a photo editing thing or a painting thing or? It's a, um, it's a painting thing, but I think you can do, I haven't gotten into it far enough to say that I can't, you can do photos in it, I'm sure. Um, I'll have to try that, to, I'll try that tomorrow. I'll load up a photo and see how that works. Because so where do you find it in Adobe? Is it in web applications then? Comes under, and it comes down from the Creative Cloud. Okay. Okay, when you have the Creative Cloud open, right. you should be able to find Fresco there. Okay. I, I just looked at my laptop, it didn't show up. I think it's just for iPads. For okay, iPhone. sorry. Oh, I have it's on the PC. I have it right here. I have the the uh, interface to create a cloud up. And you found Fresco? Yeah. Oh, for, on your PC on your PC or PC or it's not on my Mac. I'll <laughs> put it that way. Well, this is a PC. Okay. I'll give it a try, see what happens. <laughs> I, I would think if Yours is an iPad, right, Jim? I mean, even for iPads, I'm looking at it now on the App Store. Not all the iPads are compatible with it. Like, so the one I'm holding here. Yeah, it, it, it takes a newer iPad. Yeah. Um, but I broke my wife's. So I ended up getting a newer <laughs> iPad. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> heard that before. <laughs> No, no, she got the new one. I got her <laughs> old one that I broke. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what, what'd you get? For the paintbrush. That's Pardon me? Uh, fresco, and underneath it says, new power for the paintbrush. Okay, so maybe there is, maybe you can't load a photo in. I'm not sure, I, I haven't gotten in that deep. Oh. Didn't hear what you said. Uh, Adobe Fresco, draw and paint. Yeah, that's what and I'm- Digital art and vector painting. Yes. That's oh. it. I found it on the um, iPad. Vector painting, that would be interesting. Yeah, it says Adobe Fresco available on iPhone, iPad, Microsoft Surface Pro device and Creative Cloud Desktop for Windows. Oh, from Windows, not from the Mac. That's why I couldn't find uh, it. Everything in the past. Look. <laughs> that seems like a strange combination. Yeah. What are, what's anybody else working on? Getting out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> Taking any pictures? I am, but still doing tabletop photography. And that's good. Yeah, I had to cancel a trip to Northern New Mexico to take a picture of George O'Keefe's Black Place. That's, I was going to leave last Thursday. And uh, I would have been not seen the Black Place. It would have turned white. <laughs> yeah. They didn't get that much snow there, did they? Yeah, Farmington got got quite a bit of snow. Ooh. Wow. What do we want to do for next week, next month? <laughs> we can go over some of the stuff we've done before, or we can do something different. Um, we haven't really talked about overlays and textures and borders. Things you can just 
add and mix in. Textures would be fun. We could talk about those three things. Are, are anything that you add to your photo to make it more interesting? Or? Uh, now that sounds good, Mike. That sounds okay? Yep. All right, let's, let's plan on that. I, I uh, just bought some lightning overlays. No. <laughs> They're pretty cool. <laughs> uh, it, I'm really anxious to use them. You know, I got 24 lightning bolts. <laughs> yes, yes. Make them into brushes. Uh, yeah, I could. Yeah, and then I, paint them all over your top of your picture. <laughs> yeah. One of your knights could have lightning coming off his sword. <laughs> Were they crossed? Yeah. Actually, that might fit. Um, who showed the other picture? I can't. <laughs> I apologize. Who showed the, the one in the clouds, right? David. 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 Yeah, okay. Sorry. Would Barry be Wodan esque? Huh? <laughs> well, I, another question I have is uh, somebody is selling this package of a thousand backgrounds. There's iconic European things, uh, cityscapes, Western art, or Western style backgrounds which, you know, that could be fun because I'm not probably going to go to Europe anytime soon. But at what point, you know, I was thinking, at what point does it become just not a photograph, not my photograph anymore, if I'm including things from everybody else? Well, that's part of what drives me is that, you know, it's my creative um, experience. And, you know, if I have to buy, you know, a background or something like that to uh, make my experience, then it loses something for me. Mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, you know, I think it, it helps to have it, you know, your own photograph or your own, um, you know, resources available and, you know, dive into those. So would you just use your own images? That's what I've been doing. You know, everything I've done is, is my own images. What if you want to include the Eiffel Tower? You'd have to be friends. But if you want to include it and couldn't travel. Uh, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm Mike, there's a there's a simple problem. Um, I was I was watching Matt Klaskowski the other day uh, talking about the the new sky replacement tool. Mm -hmm. he, he mentioned that that you know the the application comes with about twenty skies. He says <laughs> he, he expects to see those twenty skies in lots and lots and lots of people's pictures. You know, it, you can you can download your own skies, but there's going to be a lot of people who don't do that. Oh, said, sure. oh, I've seen that sky before. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, at what point is it not your art? I remember the, um, you know, the Center for Fine Art Photography in Fort Collins, one of their exhibitions, the prize winning photo was actually a composite that somebody put together of other photos on the web. And so they never actually took a single photo of their own. And I, I just couldn't, I couldn't put my head around that one. No. But so it was their art because of their composition, the way they combined, they combined them. And the image that they created, but all of the parts of the image were built by other people. Sort of unethical. It, it, I know, I, I couldn't understand it. There's somebody in New York, some famous artist in New York that just takes pictures off the internet that other people took uh -huh. and prints them 
big with uh, some kind of slogan on it. Something like uh, monkey see, monkey do. Just, just something. And he sells those for a lot of money. Yeah. And he didn't take the picture. And people have sued him. And he's got a really good lawyer. And he has never <laughs> lost yet. Oh, boy. <laughs> and the whole concept there is that it wasn't a valuable picture until he added his little phrase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's someone, you know, if you're on Fine Art America and you look at what's hot, what's selling, you know, there's every time, every week, there's about a half dozen, you know, pieces of art that sell that are covers of the New Yorker magazine or you know, Newsweek or Sports Illustrated. And they, it's just a picture. Someone took a photograph of the cover of a magazine and it sells. I don't understand that. I can't wrap my head around it. I, I don't know how you could sell a picture of some magazine and not get sued for copyright oh, infringement. Some of those might be like Sports Illustrated is selling the cover, right? Or is that wrong? It's one person that's doing okay. you know, a lot of those things. It, it is not Sports Illustrated. Okay. And I, I thought I thought at one point I'd seen that some of those like magazines were selling their own covers on um, different places. So, but you're saying that's not it's somebody else selling. Right. Their, Maybe. Okay. Then that doesn't make sense. I, I don't know. Look, they, a lot of this is violating copyright. You think? Yeah. And this guy is making it's these are the most popular images selling? Yeah. How can that be? No, I don't know. Wow. I'll check out with the sales on fine art photography or fine art America. But I just wonder because yeah, there's all these pictures of Africa too. That you could use for your background, which, yeah, you know, some of us don't go to Africa. Some do, but uh, you could just buy it from Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and these uh, these pictures, they all come with, uh, you know, image release, so you can use them in commercial products. I just wonder, yeah, there's legal limits, but there's ethical limits too. And I... Some people don't believe in the latter. <laughs> true, <laughs> or they're very different. That's a true statement, Jim. That's a way of making it. <laughs> so uh, how, if you were to put something in, like in that uh, nice picture, I put in a tintype overlay, which I had purchased somewhere, which, you know, it's a border. I thought it was an interesting thing. Would you not do that? Would you only do things you created? You know, that would be easy to create, but, you know, because those things are, you know, in a, a royalty free environment, you know, you can. You know, it's a minor part of the picture. It's a minor part of the concept. You know, it just adds a little mood. Um, so, you, you know, how far am I willing to stretch my ethics? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, and, and you know, for something like that, I probably would, you know, use a, a background or a, an overlay, um, a texturizer or something like that. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to figure that out. I've always wanted to use just my own, but there's so you know there's quick shortcuts, nice textured backgrounds, overlays, fun things. Anyway, for next week, month, make some texture, get some text textures, and overlays, some things. Uh, maybe you make them. Maybe you find them buy them, however, and uh, we can talk about them. Uh, okay. Great. 
Sounds good. I, you okay. know, I, I've seen a great picture of a <laughs> clock or maybe, no, it was a scale. Uh, Joel Grimes did this. He took a picture of a scale and he, and it was just a, a junk scale and he overlaid it with a, a bunch of cracks and it just looked like it was hundred years old. Just very nice. Anyway, I, I think we're done. <laughs> yeah. Anything else or? But All do right. you always meet at six o'clock? I'll remember that in the future. Yes, we do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> always at six o'clock. Thanks. And thanks everybody. If you have anything you want to add, make sure it gets included in the meeting. Send me an email. I'll try and put it on the agenda. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Thank All right. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.